Well, I'm not sure how I'm going to live up to those expectations. Um, <laughs> well, as, as a paleobiologist, which is how I am by training, someone who studies uh, the history of life, life that used to exist, I really live in the past. It's something that we're not, you know, we're told that we really shouldn't do. But the past can be extremely informative for not understanding not just our present situation, but what might go on in the future. Unlike many experimental sciences, when we talk about e um, ecology and uh, climate science, there's only so much that you can actually do uh, experimentally uh, directly. A lot of the work that is done in climate science is done with modeling, and um, a lot of other work can be done by looking deep into the past to see what Earth has been like in the past. Those worlds that have once been hosted by our planet. And being a paleontologist, I'm also intimately acquainted with extinction, with the loss of biodiversity. If we look into the past, we can see that for the last several hundred million years, uh, biodiversity on land has been more or less at a sort of stable level, roughly, consistently, with the exceptions of a few periods that we call mass extinctions. This is when uh, biodiversity plummets. The functions that Alex was talking about in ecosystems fail. It's not just a period in which more species on average die out. Extinction is a natural process and happens at a slow rate throughout evolutionary history. But during mass extinctions, you get a, a full collapse of the web that holds us all together, of entire ecosystems, of worlds. Eventually, that diversity recovers, but when it comes back, it's always different. So I want to talk for a moment about the last mass extinction. 66 million years ago, springtime. We happen to know it, was, uh, it happened in the early spring uh, because of a remarkable site in North America which preserves um, specimens that died as a direct result of the proximate cause, this asteroid impact. In North America, a light appeared in the northeastern sky, came slamming down, um, at several tens of thousands of kilometers an hour and hit what is now the shallow seas off uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. It punched a crater uh, in the Earth that you can still see from space today. Around the rims of that crater, the rock is still fragile enough that it erodes into these deep sinkholes known as cenotes, which anyone who has been to Yucatan as a tourist will inevitably be drawn towards for a swim in the, in the fresh water that collects there. These are part of the fracture of the last bullet that's, that uh, extinguished 75% of species on Earth. That crater, uh, that uh, impact happening in the shallow seas and initially caused a 100 meter high tsunami that um, charged across what is now the Caribbean Sea, uh, devastating the marine deposits there and uh, ricocheting around the oceans all around the world. We find evidence of, uh, of tsunami activity more than 3,500 kilometers away from the impact site. It threw the liquid rock that um, was uh, melted by the energy of that impact up, up high into the atmosphere, which then rained down across North America. We can find little glass balls known as spherules, those solidified bits of liquid magma that had cooled in the atmosphere and landed um, as far away as Utah. And indeed, as far away as this site in Wyoming which uh, preserves uh, these um, fish specimens, gars, sturgeons, that were living along a the Western Interior Seaway, a shallow sea that uh, ran all the way up from Texas, all the way up to North Dakota. Um, these fish uh, are, uh, show signs of annual growth in their bones. And uh, we know that they all stopped growing just after a brief period of cessation, what's known as a line of arrested growth in the bone growth. So we know that these fish died at the beginning of the growing season. We can look at the uh, wood that is present in sites like this and see tree rings. Trees still produced rings back in the Cretaceous period. And we know that there were four seasons at that time in this part of the world. The fish themselves have these spherules within their gills, within their body, that um, uh, showing that this is a direct, almost the day of extinction. 
a remarkable record when we think that 66 million years have passed since then. But we can tell these stories about what happened to life. Before this mass extinction, it's the time of those charismatic megafauna of paleontology, the sort of slightly overblown poster children that are dinosaurs. Now, um, in a site known as Hell Creek in Montana, it's the site where Tyrannosaurus, perhaps the most famous dinosaur of them all, was first described. Uh, Triceratops are found there, along with a whole load of other dinosaurs that your children could certainly name, and maybe you could too. Um, the, so it's a, Hell Creek preserves a meandering river system near this western interior seaway, um, which is just a thriving forested environment. And then all of a sudden the rock layers go black. We have charcoal from the heat pulse that was generated by uh, that impact, burning the woods, preventing, um, uh, causing untold devastation to ecosystems so far away. Um, and then we get what's known as the fern spike afterwards. After the Cretaceous mass extinction, one of the immediate impacts was that so much uh, soot, ash, was thrown up into the atmosphere that photosynthesis was uh, impossible for at least two years. Um, the, the ash and soot was blanketing out the sun. And as a result, terrestrial ecosystems, based on the primary productivity of plants, collapsed. Um, the first to recover are the ferns. In, uh, uh, the, you, we get this incredible layer the fer, uh, which, where, where the fern spike is found, which is entirely dominated by the spores of these initial pioneer species, reclaiming land which has otherwise been largely uninhabitable for large numbers of plants. And eventually, we get uh, more pioneer species coming in and ecosystems building back. You get the, the swamp cypresses building up. Hell Creek becomes this slightly ponded floodscape of a landscape. Um, without trees holding the, um, without the tall trees holding the landscape together, um, the sediment has come down from the mountains and created a, and there's been a rise in the water table and the environment has changed fundamentally. And in this ecosystem we see the disaster response. Biodiversity returning once again after that extinction event. We see the, no large mammals, everything larger than roughly the size of a Labrador worldwide on land has, has gone extinct. The survivors are those that burrowed, that could live off detritus, off those, or off those creatures that themselves live on detritus. It's a, a notable fact that the biggest survivors we get are those that live in freshwater ecosystems, in lakes and rivers, which are largely based on the detritus of the land rather than initially the, eat, the immediate sort of eating of the plants themselves. It is, a, it is an ecosystem that is based on death. And among those first organisms that we find, only 20,000 years after the mass extinction event took place, we find placental mammals. Now these are mammals that are more closely related to us than they are to the marsupial mammals, kangaroos, koalas, and so on. Um, and they immediately are far more diverse themselves than, um, uh, than, than mammals had been beforehand. After extinction, when organisms that had been occupying those ecological roles in an environment have died out, other groups can emerge and replace, eventually, that biodiversity. And in the case of the last mass extinction, it is our ancestors that evolved into, uh, that took over those niches that had previously been occupied by archosaurs, dinosaurs, crocodiles, pterosaurs. We see the first true mammalian herbivores at this time. Within 200,000 years, we're seeing animals as large as pigs. Within a couple of million years, we're seeing uh, mammals the size of rhinoceroses. And what drove this increase? It's not just a, uh, in, in diversity of mammals. It's not just a, a, a release and the freedom to evolve into the space that has been left behind, but it is other species. If you look into the DNA of so many groups of mammals today, you'll find that we have defunct ancestral genes that are useful for digesting um, chitin, which is the material that forms insects' exoskeletons. Now, 
placental mammals ancestrally all ate insects. And uh, for them, those genes would have been functional, but they've been lost. They've all become defunct. And we see that in many herbivorous groups and in many omnivorous groups like us, primates, um, they become relatively defunct at about the same time, shortly after this mass extinction event. Instead, what mammals start doing is, in, in, is eating legumes and nuts. Walnuts appear at about the same time. They become extremely diverse. And mammal uh, diversification has been tied quite uh, tightly to the diversification of the walnut family. We are here because of walnuts. If we look uh, um, a lot more recently in our own past to uh, only two million years ago in the Pliocene, when the first hominids were appearing in East Africa, one of the reasons that is uh, generally uh, preferred, I would say, by anthropologists at the moment, uh, for why we are bipedal, why we have our complex problem-solving abilities, is because we lived in a mosaic environment. The environment at Kanapoi uh, on what is now Lake Turkana uh, in Kenya is this mosaic environment of forests and braided rivers and gallery forests on those rivers, grasslands, all sorts of um, different environments. And that complexity of environment is fundamental to our origin as a social and intelligent and problem-solving species and versatile species. Why was the landscape such a mosaic? And it's because of the ecosystem engineers that lived there. We are here because of the several species of elephants that lived in Kanapoi. Our own growth in, from our early mamm mammalian ancestors to the early hominids to where we are today is so dependent on the actions and the behaviors and the roles that have been played by other aspects of biodiversity. When we look into the future, one of the things that um, uh, we can do by looking at, uh, looking at paleontology is try and predict what's going to happen. If we talk, we've talked about uh, you know, Amazon rainforest today, um, a place with about three million species, um, two and a half thousand species of trees plus. Um, we see that around the equator, we get this high sort of tropical diversity. And nearer the poles, we get lower diversity. This is known as a latitudinal biodiversity gradient, a very scientific term. Um, so those big forests, like the taiga forests around Russia and Canada and, and Scandinavia, have only a few dozen species of trees making up most of the space, and only a, you know, a lowly 32,000 insects, as opposed to the more than 2 million that you'll find in tropical rainforests. That's a pattern which, if we look at the fossil record, has not always held true. Uh, this is only a pattern that exists when Earth has permanent ice at the poles. When you get into Earth's greenhouse periods, biodiversity shifts and you get peaks in the temperate regions rather than, um, uh, rather than um, in the tropics. The last time that uh, Earth did not have this tropical peak was uh, only about 30 million years ago, a piffling amount of time. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, Antarctica was home to a temperate rainforest, as we have heard about. It's very similar to the ones that you'll find in Chile and New Zealand today. Around that time, uh, the, uh, that temperate rainforest was home to marsupials, it was home to Antarctica's own endemic fauna that has been lost entirely. It's no longer, it's an environment which is just no longer supported. The lesson, I think, when we look at the past is that entire ecosystems, entire continents worth of life can be surprisingly fragile. Life persists and rebounds, diversity recovers, after mass extinctions, but the way it comes back is never the same. From the perspective of people standing on the brink of a potential but not yet realized mass extinction, we should be very careful not to throw the world that we are part of away. Thank you very much for listening.